A couple days ago, I was talking to my boys about things that they miss since we've had to make adjustments as a result of everybody else due to the stay-at-home uh, orders that are going on across the world. And so just started talking with the boys about some of the things that they missed. And one of my sons, as, as we were talking about what he misses the most, his answer caught me a little bit by surprise. Um, but he's like, chilies, Dad, I miss chilies. My son has, and he, he loves Chili's. Um, he just, he loves the restaurant. But what's funny is every time we go to, to Chili's, he orders something that he doesn't like. And every time we go, he orders it, and he refuses to try anything else. And every time, he'll eat about half of it and then be like, mm, I'm good. But yet, he keeps going back to the same item on the kids' menu that I know and Brooke knows he isn't ultimately going to like all that much, and we try to encourage him to, to order something else. But like all parents, we've learned you just have to pick your battles, and if you want to eat a less-than-stellar dinner, that's fine. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, you're at Chili's, you're going to eat a less-than-stellar dinner, but don't be hating, all right? Don't be hating. So every time we go, he orders, he orders the same exact thing, even though he doesn't like it all that much. I'm just like, why do you do that? And he's like, I don't know. It's not that bad. I kind of like it. It's all right. It's good. And it reminded me of a while ago, Brooke and I used to live in this town, and we would go to this Mexican restaurant re repeatedly. We would go to this Mexican restaurant. And one day we just looked at each other on the way home, and we're like, we don't like it that much. I don't like it that much. Do you like it that much? She's like, no, I, I, don't, I don't like it that much. And, and we're just like, why, why do we keep going here? And the answer is because it's a routine. It's a routine to order the same thing over and over again, even if you don't love it all that much. It's a routine to go to the same restaurant over and over again, even if you've reached the point where you don't really even enjoy it that much anymore. And this happens throughout life in different ways. Sometimes it's food-related. Sometimes it's relationally. You know that you're not a good, you know you're not a good match, and that's why you broke up. And yet when loneliness, when loneliness creeps in, they're the person that you start texting. They're the person that you invite to come over. They're the person that you just can't shake because for whatever reason, it's just a routine. This morning, we're going to see that maybe it was routine, maybe it was hopelessness, maybe it was helplessness, whatever the case may be, we see a scene of the disciples. Now, last week, we looked at John 20, and we saw what many people refer to as doubting Thomas, and we saw when Jesus came and he proved the fact that he was alive, he proved to Thomas that he had risen from the dead he encountered Thomas where he was in his doubt, and he met him there. And it was an encouragement to all of us that no matter where we are, no matter what we're struggling with, no matter the things that we feel like we have to hide and we have to creep down, the things that we don't like to talk about, that we encounter and that we experience, that God is not caught by surprise by any of that. God is not repelled, but rather God is the God who's willing to meet us right where we are and to prove himself to us if we would seek him out. This morning, we're going to talk, as we talked about doubt last week, this morning we're going to talk about what we do when we suffer from regret. How do we proceed when there are things in our past, there are things in our lives that just weigh us down? There are things that we wish we could take back. There are things that we have done that, truth be told, we're not sure we'll ever be able to overcome. They are things we wish we could shake off of our minds, but they're right there. And with all due respect to T. Swift, we can't just shake it off, shake it off. But it's there, and it keeps coming over and over and over again in our minds and in our lives. And the question is, what do we do in these moments of regret? And this morning, we're going to see the answer. So if you have your phones or your tablets and you're not watching there, join us in the Bible app if you would, please. As we look at John 21, John 21, we're going to start in verse 1 this morning as we see Jesus encountering his disciples. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, 
Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, what we're told is this is, again, the third sighting that most of the disciples will have had with Jesus. It's Thomas's setting. This, this is recorded for us in John 21, right after the sighting that Thomas had had of Jesus. So for some of the disciples, this is the third time now that they've seen Jesus, that Jesus has appeared to them. And yet, when you look at it, what are they doing? Well, they're going fishing. What's the significance of this? Is this just to kill time? Is this just for a hobby? No, it's something so much more than that. They're going back to their old life. For the last three years, for the last three years, they've walked with Jesus. They've seen Jesus perform miracles. They've seen Jesus heal the sick. They've seen Jesus raise the dead to life. They've seen Jesus crucified, and now he's been brought back to life. They've seen Jesus do the miraculous as he's taken some fish and a couple loaves of bread and fed thousands of people. They've heard him teach and teach differently. They've heard him teach with authority. They've seen all this. And yet, they're at the point in their lives or they're just willing to go back. You have to remember to understand the significance of what we're encountering here, the start of their journey, the start of their story. It's recorded for us in one of the places in Mark 1, 16 to 20, where Andrew, Peter, James, and John are all fishermen. That's their trade. That's their career. That's their livelihood. It's how they made their money. In many ways, Similar to today, a lot of times people's identities are wrapped up within their profession. And here they were, fishermen, who had an encounter with Jesus. And in Mark 1.17, don't lose the significance of this. Jesus makes a statement to them. He said, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. I will change the narrative of your life. I will make you fishers of men. And for the next three years, that is exactly what happened as they followed Jesus from town to town. And they saw all of those things happen. But now, things are different. They're not sure what to do, and so they go back to their old life. They go back to what things were like before they started following Jesus. And here are these professional fishermen experiencing the worst feeling in the world that anyone who fishes has ever experienced. And that's coming in empty. That night, they are out on the water their nets in the water, they're trying to catch fish, and they're coming up completely empty. And if you've ever gone fishing, you know the feeling of what it's like to not have anything to show for the effort, not have anything to show for the time. And here they are, with all the doubts and all the uncertainties, all the regrets weighing in their minds about their final hours with Jesus, about the plea of a friend for them to stay awake and to pray with him and they fall asleep, about their fear to to not even acknowledge that they know Jesus, about the fact that in Jesus' darkest hour, they scattered and were nowhere to be found. With all of those regrets, plaguing their minds. They go back to the life that they once knew, and even that is unsuccessful. Have you been there? Where nothing in your life is going right. Everything is falling apart. Everything is falling short. What do you do? That's where these disciples were. We continue in verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. 
Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. This is the first question that's asked of anyone who goes fishing. When you come back and the people that you know, they knew that you went fishing, the first question is, what would you catch? What did you catch? What do you have to show for it? What do you have? And there's no worse feeling in the world than having to say, I got nothing. I got nothing. And here he is, Jesus, calling out from the shore, calling to them and saying, what do you have to show for it? What do you have? What have you caught? See, the truth is that all of us in life can relate to this. Whether it's a fishing journey or whether it's something much more significant in our lives. Where that which we once found our purpose, that where we once found fulfillment, that which we once elevated to be something that we work so hard towards, something that sustains us and our family, something that is a dream of ours. We've all been there. And when we go out and the dream dies and the failure creeps in and we have to encounter it and we have to look it square in the face and acknowledge that we weren't as successful as we wanted to be, there's no worse feeling than that coming face to face with failure. And here's where it takes you even down another level. is when everyone else sees it too. The plague of the fishermen isn't just having an empty net. The plague of the fishermen's having an empty net and having to come to shore. Where everyone else sees that the net is also empty. And that's where you reach your point. Man, I hate it when my net's empty, but I hate it even more when my net's empty and it's obvious to everyone. There are no fish. They've caught nothing. They went back to what they thought was a sure thing. They went back to what they knew before following Jesus. They went back to the thing that they always thought they could fall back on. And even on this night, it leaves them empty. What have you caught? Nothing. Verse 6 says, he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Jesus from the shore is yelling out to the professional fishermen, hey, put your nets on the other side. You'll catch some. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it was just disbelief at this point. I don't know whether it was just annoyance that they were out there and they had nothing to show for it. I don't know if it, they just hit the breaking point where it's like, I will try anything at this point. But I have to imagine. I have to imagine that the professional fishermen who are sitting in the boat taking directions from somebody on the shore have to be just a little bit annoyed. They have to be thinking, oh, right, because we wouldn't have thought of that. We'll try that. Let's cast our net over on the other side. It's like when you've been working on a project for a couple hours and somebody just comes in to check in on your progress and things aren't going well and they're like, well, have you thought to try this? Yes, an hour and a half ago. Thank you very much. Try it again. Oh, okay. I'll try it again. Cast your nets on the other side. You'll catch some fish. I love it. Jesus is on the shore telling the old fishermen how to fish. And then verse six continues, so they cast it and they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. 
throw their nets on the other side, and now the nets, which were empty, could barely contain all the fish that they were now catching. John looks at the others and says, that has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus. And Peter puts on his outer clothes. He stripped down to his underwear. He puts on his clothes, and he throws himself into the sea. They can't contain their catch. And here is Peter, fresh off the regrets of the denial of Jesus, fresh off those regrets of being asked three times if he knew him and saying, no, I don't. And hours before being told by Jesus, you will deny me. And Peter's saying, I will never deny you. I will die before I deny you. And hours later, denying Jesus. He hears that it's Jesus and he jumps overboard. He jumps out of the boat and he starts to swim toward Jesus. And this is a question that we all have to ask. Is in the moments of failure, in the moments of regret, in the moments of our rebellion, do we run to God? In the moments where we have the mistakes that are fresh on our mind, they are fresh and they just continue to plague us. Are we willing to run to God? Or is our approach to try to hide and try to sleep, sneak away? Is it something you bury? Is it something you don't acknowledge? Or is it something that you take? Present it to God knowing that he already knows. And deal with that way. What is your response when regret plagues your mind? The other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, but about a hundred yards off. The rest of the disciples, they bring in their massive catch, and then verse 9 tells us this. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught, so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Listen, when we are tempted to run away, when we are tempted to throw in the towel, when we are tempted to quit, when we are tempted to go back to our old life, when we are tempted to allow the regrets and the mistakes of our lives to weigh us down and to win, in all of those moments when we are tempted to listen to the lies and accept the lie that God wants nothing to do with us, that we are too far gone for God to do anything good Good with our lives. When, when that lie comes, and I promise you this, it will. And when it plagues not only our minds, but it seeps its way down into our hearts, and it plagues us at every core of our being, in that moment, we have to remember that we serve a God who not only meets us right where we are, he not only is willing to meet us right where we are, but he shows up and he serves us breakfast in the process. That no matter how far we've fallen, no matter how far we've run, no matter how many mistakes we have, no matter what regret we carry, no matter what everybody else labels us as and says about us, we are never too far gone for God to do something incredible. And here he is on the beach, just waiting. And not only that, but he's made him breakfast. 
and he gives them an invitation to come at breakfast. Verse 13 says, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And I can't help but think that in their minds, as they sat down and they had breakfast, they had to be thinking about the last meal that they'd enjoyed. I'm not sure that there was much joy in that process. But looking back, they had to remember the upper room. And Jesus taking the bread and breaking it and passing it out and telling them in language that they did not understand what was about to happen in just a matter of hours, that his body would be broken for them and for us. That's the last meal. That as he passed the wine, he said, this, is, this represents my blood, which is a new covenant poured out for you. I have to think that as they shared breakfast, they flashed back to the last meal that they'd had before. Verse 15 tells us, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus' question for Peter, not why did you deny me? Why were you so scared? Why did, you, why did you vow that you would never, never deny me? Why did you vow that you would die for me only to deny me three times and run away in shame? Where were you in my darkest hour? No, 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 that's not the question. The question that Jesus has for Peter is this. Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. What's the response of Jesus? Feed my lambs. The love of Jesus compels us to act in a certain way. And here when Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? And Peter answers in the affirmative. And he says, yes, you know that I love you. The response of Jesus lets us know how we best can reveal our love for Jesus. And the answer that Jesus gives him is, you love me? Go serve people. You love me? Go serve people. This is the proof that if you love Jesus, the proof of that needs to be found in your serving of his people. That we reveal our personal love for Jesus and how we love one another. How we serve each other. That's the test. And that is the proof. He goes on and says, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. Are you sure? Are you sure that you love me? This is the, this is the second question. The second question is, are you sure? Are you sure that you really love me? And Peter answers in the same way. He says, yes, you know, you know that I do. You know that I love you. And notice what Jesus says. He says, take care of each other. Serve me by serving my people. Love me by serving one another. And in verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times the question's asked, do you love me? Three times the answer's given. But as it's asked the third time, Peter breaks down. Because he remembers. Of course he remembers. He remembers the vow that he made. He remembers the promise that he gave. That God, I will never leave you. I will follow you unto my death. Just hours later, never mind his good intentions. Never mind his declaration. Never mind all of that. Just hours later, he denied him and ran away. I don't know the declaration that you made, that you have broken. I don't know the promise that you once declared, that you ran away from. I don't know the situation that you encountered that you swore up and down. I will, I will never do this. Never. Only to hours later find yourself in contradiction to the very thing you declared. I don't know what that is for you, but I know it's there. Because it's there for all of us. Every single person. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why does Jesus ask three times? Is it just to put the knife in a little bit and twist it each time? Well, that doesn't go to the nature of the heart of Jesus. Or could it be that Jesus asks Peter three times whether or not he loves him as a way of declaring something much bigger? That God is bigger than our regrets. That God isn't blind to them, but he's redeemed them. And no matter what baggage we carry from the past, no matter what everybody else says about us, no matter how everybody else defines us, Jesus gives us a chance. A redemption. And a new start. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Don't miss it. This is exactly what Jesus said to him when he said, follow me, to start their relationship. Three plus years earlier, when Jesus called out to them and said, you now, you are fishermen, but I will change the narrative. I will change the direction on your story. And I will make you fishers of men. Come, follow me. And here they are, back out on the sea, 
fishing again, going back to their old life. And here's the encounter with Jesus. And he restores them and he redeems them. And he says to them, follow me. You are never too far gone. No matter what you might believe about yourself, you are never too far gone. And the message of Jesus to you today is one that he is calling out to you and it has not changed whether you've turned your back and run away or not. The message has not changed. He's calling out to you and he's saying, follow me. But this is the reality that he really wants Peter to understand. And this is the reality that we must understand. That if we're going to follow Jesus, it means we have to follow. Follow me to wherever I send you, he says. Follow me to horrible circumstances. Follow me to an excruciating death. That's what he's just told Peter here. Follow me to an excruciating death, to horrible circumstances, to wherever I send you. Whether you want to go or not, follow me means we have to follow. And this is the reality that Jesus never promised us an easy life. Not once. The question is, are we willing to follow? Maybe today your life is one that is just defined by regret. And you've been carrying that weight for a really long time. Because you feel like you've let everyone down and you feel like you're too far gone. You have two options. You can hide, you can run away, or you can follow the lead of Peter and swim with all your might as fast as you can to encounter Jesus and see that God not only loves you, but we serve a God who not just shows up, he cooks breakfast. And he's there ready to redeem and restore every regret. Are you going to keep carrying it? Or are you going to give it to him and follow him no matter where he leads, no matter what it costs, really follow. That's the choice that you have. My hope and my prayer for you is that your response will be like Peter's. And you will experience the freedom that only comes when we truly follow Jesus. God, I pray that we would be people who refuse to allow regret to define our lives. I know that every single person watching this right now has something they can point to. I pray for the person right now, God, who's watching, who's given up. Who's thrown in the towel, who just believes they're too far gone. I pray, God, today, right now, this moment, instead of hiding, instead of quitting, that they would run to you. I 
pray, God, today would be the day they say enough with the regret. I'm going to follow Jesus. Thank you for being a God who loves us when we mess up. Thanks for being a God who never leaves us even when we run from you. Thanks for your forgiveness and your grace not just showing up, but showing up with breakfast and new opportunities every single day. So God, let us run from regret and let us follow you. Help us, Jesus, we pray.